Cecile B. Evans. Uh, for Cecile, there's no border or little border between life online and offline. Uh, her work examines the value of emotion in contemporary society and how the increasing influence of new technologies have an impact in our feelings, but also in our identities, or some say digital identities. She also explores the representation of emotions and the use of these as a tool for contemporary narratives. Her works have been exposed in Tate Liverpool, Moscow Museum of Modern Art, uh, Musée d'Art Moderne de la Ville de Paris, uh, with works like um, Hyperlinks or It Didn't Happen, Handy If You Are Learning to Fly, and What the Heart Wants. Um, Feeling for You is a lecture performance that will take us on an emotional ride that I will describe as the materializ materialization of the performative act of hyperlinking. Welcome, Cecile. Hello? Yes, great. Um, so I've decided to switch things up a bit because Feeling For You has turned out to be an hour long. Um, and I'm going to present um, my most recent project called Amos's World. And Amos's World is set in a fictional television show about a socially progressive housing estate. The first episode, of which there are three in total, or will be three in total, is viewed in a modular one-third scale section of a brutalist tower block. So the visitors climb into individual viewing pods and watch the single channel video alone and together within the same structure. And the plot centers around Amos, an ambitious architect, and the supposedly perfect individual communal living structure he dreams of creating. His plans are complicated by a character called the Weather, who reveals that the building does in fact already exist and is failing. The tenants have been unable to conform to Amos's expectations. Um, I'm not able to show you the full video today, but I made a little recap of episode one. I want to change the world. No! I want to express myself. No! I'm the architect. I'm the weather. This could be really stupid. When I'm finished, they'll be able to smell, feel, and experience the new life that's being offered. Those are the Nargis. They also live here. They're just gone. Amos, do you know what year it is? Of course I know what year it is. This monumental building you've been asked to build. Yes. We're all living in it. Their pain, their suffering, is given a voice by my understanding of it. So their pain gives meaning to your pain, which makes you feel better. Yes, and? Yeah. The true end of the building is thankless. No victories, no defeats, no spontaneous wash of relief. The end is remote and fixed. Hopes that make for needs, that steal demands from those deep-seated comforts. Maybe. In that ending, she is alive, she is well, and she is maybe no longer mine. Gloria, do you hear me? I hear you.
Thanks for watching. So the starting point for the project was an archetype, the tragic white male, who is nearly always treated in fiction and in life as though his foibles are worth it for what he is able or might even just be able to produce, how he might change the world. So one of the major references for the character of Amos was the architect, Le Corbusier, who many of you may know, is considered the foremost pioneer in his fields for his far-reaching ideals of a city within a building. His 1933 book, La Ville Radieuse, creates both inspiring and troubling allusions to a new system that will radically change the human way of life. He meticulously lays out his plans as to what, in order of priority, are the basic principles of humanity. His focus is primarily on what would come to be known as brutalism, a return to simple materials and a kind of prototype for a very organized city planning. Everything anyone would or should want could be contained within the compound's walls. Another major reference point for the project was the work of Allison and Peter Smithson, architects who would adopt Le Corbusier's ideals for a two-building housing, so social housing estate in an East London neighborhood plagued by po poverty and vandalism after the decline of the Docklands, called Robin Hood Gardens, which is right next to my house. Amongst its many features included a wall advertised to block the sound that resembled prison gates and its signature gardens, which is in actuality a mound erected between the two structures to keep children from playing football in an undesignated area. In his public face, Peter Smithson promised that the compound would release its inhabitants, and he seemed convinced that they would see, hear, and feel the new life that was being offered to them. Along with his wife, he dictated a kind of self-imposed state of responsibility and reliance within the complex, stating, if we're not to be torn apart by our differing individual na natures as makers and destroyers, Society has to make a framework so that the makers can get ahead of the destroyers. And here he's confusing a bit between the architect and society. So she added that after all, the tenants were an extension of herself and Peter, and not some kind of nebulous creatures. The Smithsons, like many architects, presumed a kind of universality. This universality has been clearly documented in standards manuals, such as this one, Neufurt's, which emerged as the industrial age progressed to help produce growth at a rapid scale on an unprecedented global level. They collated hundreds of pages of data on the human being, how they might sit, the adequate width needed for them to carry luggage or bend over. So this, combined with added value of social progress, could produce misunderstandings between a design and its user. One of the earliest examples of this was the Frankfurter Kitchen, created by Margarita schutt lehoski for Ernst May's social housing project after the First World War. It imagined the optimal number of steps required for the optimal numbers of tasks a woman might need to work efficiently in the kitchen so that she could be liberated to do other things. It was obviously later criticized for making assumptions about a woman's shape, size, and abilities, as well as alienating her and relegating her to a space that could only fit one person at a time. These well-intentioned data sets and humanistic fantasies, most frequently drafted and promoted by difficult or troubled male geniuses, became a really great entry point to discuss Amos's dreams as an allegory for the networked age. After all, it was Apple that first promised to liberate us from oppression, while Google later promised to predict and interconnect our every curiosity, concern, and desire. And platforms like Facebook have transitioned from mere social services to providing news, safety, and public awareness products. Through the use of controlled and data-manipulated feeds, they have changed the chronology of our timeline. All of these companies have openly promoted a future ability to understand how you feel at any time, anywhere, so that really, you don't need anything else. 
1933, Le Corbusier said, we cannot leave millions of men, women, and young people to spend seven or eight hours a day in the street. We are faced with the urgent task of creating living quarters capable not only of containing the people that live in them, but also, and above all, of retaining them. If Le Corbusier's plan was for a city within a building, then with time the archetypal troubled genius males of our time have conceived of a society within a network. A perfect individual communal structure built on the promise of a collective individualism, financed by the commodification and valuation of equality, freedom, and our emotional well-being. We have recently begun to learn of their imperfections, most notably using the digital platforms they have built for us. This society within a network begins to feel like a closed feedback loop that we do not have the tools or skills with which to unlock. Throughout my research, I noted the particular and brutal chaos of the failures of these buildings. The Smithson's Robin Hood Gardens is slated for demolition, with one of the two buildings already decanted of its tenants while the other looks on. Peter Smithson had complained of the smell of their cooking, their inability to use the building as it should have been. You don't get to choose your first users, they said. Pruitt Igo, built in 1956 as a segregated paternalistic solution to poverty and the St. Louis slums, was branded a disaster by the 1960s, with the municipality all but abandoning it and the police force no longer responding to calls for help. Ponte City, built in Johannesburg in, in 1975. Sam Bunton's 1971 plan for a Manhattan skyline in Glasgow. And Naples' Villa de Scampia, or the Sales of Scampia, also abandoned by the local police until recently, where there was an effort to rehabilitate in most of these cases, there is a call for destruction, coupled with a generous, generously financed offer of total redevelopment led by private companies. But in all of these places, people have lived and continue to live there with real exchanges and experiences that form their memories. The structures, the systems proposed did not work for them, but this is a place where they continue to find themselves. In Amos's world, we meet the secretary, who is based on a forgotten and nameless part of digital folklore, artificial intelligence pioneer Joseph Weizenbaum's secretary, who takes in a trio of flowers as part of a single parent housing benefit scheme going in the building until they leave to join a listed terrorist organization called the Rainbow Connection. The secretary takes on a particular power dynamic and tries to steer her lost narrative to cannibalize the much more relevant one of the flowers. She feels their pain. She is empowered. She is also based on white feminism's polarization of the rights of black women and other women of the civil rights movement. There is an actress who confesses she feels there is no need to leave the house and has not for some time. She surmises, however, that her images, which she calls her projections, have traveled far and wide, and that people have more of a relationship to these projections than she does to anyone herself. Her mother is played by an animated swallow who is endangered by the solar panels powering the solarium, Amos's piece de resistance. When I visited Moisha Safdie's Habitat 67 in the outskirts of Montreal, I noticed that there was a local shop built into the estate. It was the only one around for miles. And I was told that the shop only restocked the tenants' regular products, and they would do so over and over again. There is the weather, who serves as a disturbance to Amos as she prods holes into his many arguments, as he becomes increasingly convinced that if his project must be a disaster, it must also be spectacular. And finally, the time traveler, a former inhabitant of the building who has been traveling through space and sending letters to a woman named Gloria who has not left the building for some time. She recognizes the presumed satisfaction in the destruction of the building, the moment that everyone's head finally turns in the same direction, the joy of a collective experience. 
But, I mean, this may be really stupid. We may have to rethink the whole thing. It may be that we should only be asked to, to repair the roofs and add the odd bathroom to the old industrial houses and just leave people where they are to smash it up in complete abandon and happiness so that nobody has to worry about it anymore. The time traveler later denounces this willful bend towards demolition as a false promise and says that the anticipation of suffering becomes a passive and privileged kind of suffering itself. This show is very dark and very depressing. Really? And you go through a very rough time, yeah. and then seeing you smiling again puts me in a very good mood. <laughs> it's a sex romp. That's you think really, this is a sex it's romp? Not that bad. It is not a sex Come romp. On. Uh, what, now, for those who don't know, this is based on a Margaret Atwood book from 1985. Explain mm -hmm. uh, for us who you play. Yes, uh, try to stay with me. It's a little uh, far fetched, but it's about a right wing fundamentalist group who takes over the government uh -huh. and takes away um, all of women's rights. Okay, all yeah. right. So. Yeah. So it's like, yeah. <laughs> so it's like a present apocalypse movie. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> totally. Uh she denounces the possibility of any collective experience and proposes through the idea of a body experiencing trauma, the idea of a collection of experiences within a single accepted framework as a means to resist the temptation to give in to total destruction and depression myself. It is slowly revealed that the intended recipient of the time traveler's love letters is the actress contained within her apartment, Gloria. Gloria reveals that she too is still in love. Rebecca Solnit's Hope in the Dark proposes hope as a kind of resistance and illustrates the actual, real, and difficult progress that is attained quietly, in spite of and throughout hope's challenges. This is something I hope to explore in episodes two and three of next year, to think about how to develop skills and tools to contend with the vast spectrum of realities, all within the framework we have accepted as this world. I think that we exist in a time with the opportunity to start tackling the totality with all of its successes and failures. Thank you.